Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining today's webinar, Will You Have Enough Income in Retirement? Part of our All Things Retirement series. My name is Kelly Schweppe and I'm the Program Marketing Specialist here at General Electric Credit Union. We're so glad you've joined us as we have a lot of great content ahead. Thanks to technology, we're excited to be able to connect with you on such a great topic and wanted to thank you all for tuning in from the comfort of your home, work, or wherever you may be today. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Eric Waldron to introduce himself and take us through today's topic. Thanks, Kelly. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon for today's webinar uh, on retirement income. A quick introduction of myself before we uh, get started. My name is Eric Waldron. I am one of the advisors with the credit union. I have been in the financial services business for nearly 27 years, with my last eight years being here at GE Credit Union. Simply put, I help our members with retirement planning, investments, and risk management. Areas that I uh, cover range from asset allocation uh, to insurance with life and long-term care, Social Security and Medicare planning, legacy next generation planning, uh, to full financial planning with our award-winning planning software, Money Guide Pro, which I will touch, touch on briefly later in this uh, webinar. And uh, finally, on to today's topic of retirement income and understanding the challenges many of you face, such as longevity, rising medical costs, uh, general inflation, market fluctuations, and volatility. And on top of that, what we have seen, and we've been in an environment where, where pensions are becoming obsolete, and we're relying more and more on our nest eggs and Social Security to fund our goals uh, and expenses in retirement. So with that, let's uh, jump right in and uh, start the presentation. So planning for retirement income starts with these three basic questions. You know, what does retirement mean to you, right? That is, hey, what do you want and expect to do in retirement? Is it travel? Is it pursue a hobby? Uh, volunteer your time or start a new business? So it's important to consider your expectations carefully uh, because retirement income planning will be, or a retirement income plan will be designed to support these goals. When do you plan on, on retiring? As we'll discuss, the age at which you plan to retire can have an enormous impact on your overall retirement income situation. And then finally, how long will your uh, in, you know, retirement last? In other words, how long of distribution uh, period should you plan for, right? So when advisors 20 years ago, uh, 30 years ago, they had a lot shorter of a runway to plan for maybe only 20 to 25 years. Well, now with longevity being very real, we are now having to plan for 30 to 35 years. So let's spend a few minutes on discussing these last two questions. So <clears throat> early um, retirement considerations. As I've mentioned, when you decide to retire can have this enormous impact on your overall situation. So what do we look at? We look at fewer accumulation years on this early retirement, right? Giving up prime years that you have to save. This is where you're going to be hopefully maxing out your 401ks. Um, also, earning more money than you have in your prior years, which can help a pension. Um, also, with early retirement, you're going to have longer distribution periods, right? Very simple. Simply, you're lo the longer you have that your assets will need to last to support you and your goals throughout retirement. Um, impact on Social Security, right? 62 is when you can start taking Social Security, um, but that could be very detrimental in the fact that it could be a 25 to 30 percent reduction, depending on your full retirement age, of that benefit amount. So um, another area that we're going to also focus on, healthcare and Medicare, right? Not being eligible for Medicare until age 65. So what happens? Well, you have to self-insure. That can be a very daunting and expensive uh, task uh, while you wait to get to 65. You know, a lot of these plans that are available out there, um, you know, it could be $800 to $1,000 a month per person. That And with, with that said, these are high deductible plans, so they're not great plans either. Um, so that is something also you really want to consider if your employer would not cover you. Uh, how am I going, going to insure myself prior to that age 65? Um, and then impact on your pension benefit. Again, I'm, typically these are your greatest accrual years, right? When you're later in your uh, work years, 
uh, or your final years. And so simply that put, this would reduce your benefit. Um, and so obviously, you know, these are considerations that you would all have to take into consideration. Does it make sense? Can I do this uh, with these negatives that I've just mentioned? So, you know, as you may suspect, delaying retirement uh, presents certain advantages, right? So basically, this is just going to be the opposite of the prior slide. More accumulation years, again, for those retirement savings, for those employer matches into 401ks. Uh, maybe you're going 401ks and IRAs, depending on income levels. Um, we're also going to have shorter distribution period, right? So this is less risk of outliving your money. Um, impact on Social Security. Now, if we got to our full retirement age, we have an increased benefit. And if we keep working past that full retirement age, excuse me, full retirement age, we also get an 8% per year cost of living adjustment, right, up to age 70. So that can impact your Social Security significantly to the upside. Um, impact on healthcare. So we go right to Medicare. Hopefully, you know, you get to 65. We don't have to worry about um, self-insuring. Um, and so you, throughout this time, had still had your access to your employer's healthcare. So these would be uh, the delayed considerations. So working during retirement, right? So earnings reduce demand on personal savings, simply put. Um, very self-explanatory. You have potential to access uh, health care, even for part-time work. Um, you know, some people will go and go back to work and have access to those employer plans, which sometimes could be better than what Medicare might offer. Um, effect on Social Security. So if you do work during retirement, you'll want to make sure you understand how this will affect your Social Security benefits. So basically, you've heard it's going to reduce $1 for every $2 you earn over roughly $19,000. So that's for 2021. So simply put, um, if you said, hey, I, I, I earned $25,000 in 2021 through part-time work, well, that is about $6,000 over divided by those $2. That is $3,000 that your benefit would be reduced for the year. So roughly put, if I had to divide that by 12, it'd be about $250 a month. Um, so knowing that, hey, that is, that is able to be retrieved down the road, but while you're in these years prior to full retirement age, there will be a reduction. Um, and then you have non-financial non, you know, benefits of, of working, right? So social interaction, sense of accomplishment, structure that people like, right? Getting up with a purpose uh, that work brings. Um, and one of the other things, one last observation I'll make on this topic is if you're working for an employer that offers a traditional pension, determine whether working part-time will impact your benefits. So if your benefit is based on your final average pay, it's possible that working part-time could reduce your benefit. Uh, so it could be worth your while to inquire about phased retirement programs that uh, your employer might offer. And these programs allow you to receive all or part of your pension benefit while you, while you continue to work uh, for that employer on a part-time basis. These have become very uh, popular, especially here with GE. So when it comes to your retirement, how long should you plan for, right? Well, we're living longer. That's the simple truth. Nearly 90,000 Americans are 100 years of age. That's, that's crazy, right? That was not the situation, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, 20, 25 years ago. So an average American uh, can expect to live roughly about 20 more years at 65. Uh, life expectancy is likely to continue to increase. I mean, if you look at a chart with all the advances in modern medicine and biotechnology, we are, we've gone really parabolic uh, up to the right corner over the last 80 years. So now, again, retirement may last more than that 20, 25 years, which means, hey, savings and income will need to last that long as well. So every retirement income plan has to balance these three main goals, right? Maximize your ability to enjoy retirement. Uh, that means making sure you have that ability to do the things that you want to do. Uh, manage the risk of outliving your income, right? This is, how do I manage it? Well, uh, let's... Make sure we have a budget in place, right? The living expenses are very important 
uh, as they happen every month for 12 times a year for the next 30 years. Um, and then we want to manage the risk of unexpected life events, right? This could be a serious illness, terminal illness, or worse yet, a long-term care. Well, not worse, but I mean, long-term care, depending on the situation, um, it can be un, you know, unanticipated and very costly, right? So, uh, you know, a, a room here in Cincinnati for a uh, long-term care facility is, is roughly $100,000 to $110,000 a year. Do I have insurance in place for that? Um, can I afford insurance for that? So being able to manage the risk of these unexpected life events or what I call what if uh, is going to be very important. So <clears throat> on to the retirement income. So uh, planning the process. So once you know when your retirement will, will start, how long it may last, uh, the type of lifestyle you want, it's time to estimate, hey, what's that amount of money I'm going to need to make this all happen? And so we start right there in that uh, upper right is number one is, hey, we estimated how much income you'll need. Again, this is where we're going to look at, hey, things like basic living expenses. What is Medicare going to cost us? Part A, Part B, Part D for our drugs, supplemental. Um, you know what? We want to make sure that travel is going to be a, a part of our, uh, you know, retirement. So we're going to get those expenses, uh, figure out what that uh, amount is, and then we're going to look at, Hey, and consider, hey, things like inflation, right? Um, taxes, are they on the rise? You know, there's, you know, down the road, that's a big concern people have. Um, sequence of returns is another very important one. So that, you know, simply put, when the losses happen to you are actually more important than the losses themselves. Um, early on, if you experience you know, significant drops in the market and you're withdrawing, that could be very detrimental. So being able to make sure that we have a portfolio set up correctly that can weather storms like that, especially early in those retirement years. Then we're going to add all your income sources there at the bottom, you know, total from Social Security. Hopefully you're lucky enough to have a pension. And then we're going to do a simple subtraction, expenses minus income to identify this gap. And then using savings, retirement savings, 401ks, IRAs, uh, you know, strategies and allocations and products to consider based on your risk tolerance, based on your situation to bridge this gap. And and that's the importance, especially with, you know, pensions becoming a thing of the past, the importance of, you know, bridging this gap, making sure we have the assets to bridge this gap, as Social Security most likely isn't going to cover all those expenses. So, how much annual income? will you need? What, when trying to figure out how much you'll need in retirement, you may be tempted to only rely on some simple um, general guidelines. I don't ne necessarily agree with all of them, but here's the general guidelines. Um, you'll need 60 to 90 percent of your pre-retirement income. Uh, these are helpful, but as they're not, you know, set in stone as everyone has those unique circumstances and goals. So think about what expenses will change, you know, possibly, hopefully, uh, a mortgage might drop off three, four, or five years into your retirement, or a car loan. But on the other hand, we got to plan for those in increased healthcare costs. That's that's a big thing when I'm sitting down doing financial planning software with people. Is the eye opener is, oh boy, I did not expect Medicare to cost this, right? So those are going to be some increases that you might not have been aware of. As you get older, you might not be able to, you know, mow your yard or remove snow. So things that you're going to add into um, that are going to change during your retirement. Uh, we're going to also include costs for special retirements or, or retirement pursuits, such as travel, hobbies, celebrations. Uh, and then this is the most important. Again, I kind of touched on this earlier, listing those monthly expenses, basic living expenses. It's painstaking. It's a pain. But the most important part of a financial plan, again, as it's going to happen 12 times a year for the next 30 years or so in retirement. So accounting for healthcare costs, again, that biggest eye opener we talked about, you know, they, they've got a stat out there that says, you know, a 65 year old couple can expect to spend two, 275 to $300,000 in Medicare costs. That's not even a major issue like long-term care, or like I said, a terminal illness earlier. So Medicare coverage is gonna begin at 65, you know, paying for that, that, that part B, 
which is going to be taken out of your Social Security Part D for your drugs, and then these Medigap policies or supplemental insurance that covers the gaps that Medicare doesn't cover itself, that Part A. Um, and again, Medicare will not pay for long-term care. Um, you know, can I afford long-term care insurance? Do, do I think that's important? Is, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, is it in my family? That's, you know, it's a very hereditary uh, disease. Um, but knowing that Medicare is not going to pay that. And accounting for the cost of long-term care. So what is long-term care, right? Um, again, this is people suffering from a chronic health condition or disability, uh, a cognitive issue. Typically, you can't perform two of the six activities of daily living. Um, most individuals over 65, there's a stat out there that says a 70% chance that you will need some point or some type of care at some point in your life. And there's your national average, right? $93,000. Again, Cincinnati, more expensive. So what are your options? You got three options. You can gamble, roll the dice, pay out of pocket. Well, maybe you're rich enough. Maybe you have enough assets that that's the play. Um, you know, rely on Medicaid, and that's spending down your savings uh, to a certain level that uh, uh, is set by Medicaid. And then or have long-term care insurance, right, to have that coverage. So major factors to consider, you know, again, before we, you know, we move on, we're going to talk about these retirement income sources and what can challenge them, um, accounting for inflation. So, you know, typically we have seen inflation, you know, uh, between that two to two and a half percent. But of recent, what have we seen? Well, I, you know, I implore you to go to the grocery, walk through the dairy aisle, walk through any aisle, actually. Um, let's go to the pump, to, you know, where we're paying for gas. I will argue that inflation is higher, three, three and a half, possibly. Um, then we have healthcare. Healthcare doesn't inflate like normal inflation. Healthcare, five, six percent annually. Education, even worse, can be up to upwards of seven or eight percent. Also, recognizing the impact of taxes. What is our tax, you know, what's that tax table going to look like in retirement? Is it going to be higher? What is, you know, what are the politics involved there? And then understanding potential risks such as market risk, right? That's the volatility in 2008, COVID. We lost 40% in a month. Um, and again, another thing I always am going to stress when I, and, I, and I, I talk about this a lot when I'm sitting with our members, is those sequence of returns and making sure you have an asset allocation that is going to be able to weather any of these major drops uh, that have happened and, and will happen. And it's just part of, you know, what the market has done over time. But we, what we know is not being, I guess, making a bad decision when these drops happen, having those allocations and plans set uh, correctly to be able to get through those tough times. So accounting for inflation, this is uh, always an eye opener. You know, this assumes 3%, which is kind of what I was talking about here a few slides back. You know, in 25 years, it will cost you over $100,000 to buy those same goods and services that you can buy today for 50 grand. Um, so unless you accurately account for inflation, you'll likely un underestimate the amount of annual income that you will need during your retirement. So basically all other things being equal, inflation means that you'll need more retirement income each year just to keep pace uh, and make sure that those assets don't run out, right? Everybody's number one concern is running out of money. We wanna make sure that we account for this um, along with those other things such as longevity uh, and sequence of returns and making sure we're allocated correctly. So the impact of taxes sometimes can be overlooked, right? Taxes can eat into your income significantly, reducing what's available to you. So, um, you know, some are surprised on ordinary income taxes on your interest in your, in your CD or that your Social Security is taxed, depending on your, your income levels. A uh, special tax rate for uh, long-term capital gains and qualifying dividends, uh, depending, again, on income levels. Uh, you know, long-term capital gains will have a fixed flat, flat rate, 15 20%. Tax-free income, you know, certain uh, municipal bonds are going to be tax-free for federal, uh, sometimes state as well. 
And then having these uh, special rules for those tax advantage accounts, such as traditional 401ks and IRAs. Um, obviously, traditional 401 and IRAs are going to be exposed to ordinary income, but a lot of people now have options and access to Roth 401ks. Uh, I personally do. I personally recommend those for most people if they can, you know, if they can based on their, um, you know, expenses and their personal situation, uh, because that money is going to be tax free, right? A million dollars in an ordinary IRA is quite different than a million dollars in a Roth IRA at the end of, uh, you know, at your retirement or the beginning of your retirement. So understanding risk. This is going to be the market risk. This is fluctuations in the market that you, you are used to, hopefully by now. Um, the bond market reinvestment risk, right? This is having to reinvest at lower rates. A lot of people are seeing this with CDs that are maturing. You know, CDs from five years ago that are paying three, three and a quarter are paying less than 1% today. So that is reinvestment risk, rate risk, right? Uh, and that's what the next one is. So rates rise, you know, bonds and certain investments like utilities, banks, Real estate investment trusts, they drop, they move inversely. Um, and also understanding when those losses happen to you with the sequence of returns is going to be very important in understanding your overall risk exposure and profile. So sources of retirement income, we got that three-legged stool, right? Social security. Hopefully, if you're a married couple, we got two social security coming, two social <laughs> two social securities coming in. Um, employer pension, and that's becoming, as I mentioned, a thing of the past. Less than 15% of Americans are receiving pensions or will receive pensions. Um, and then we have our individual savings and investment, which we are becoming more and more dependent on. So let's talk about uh, the Social Security benefit basics. We're going to have our benefit calculation. It's going to look at our 35 highest earning years, right? You can go look at your earnings record. Just sign up at ssa.gov, uh, sign up for an account. You can view your record. You know, start date, that's anywhere anywhere between 62 and 70 years of age. As we discussed, working in retirement, how it will it affect your benefit, um, any reductions. Inflation, so there is inflation, you know. So, for instance, this year is a big inflation year, over 5%. Uh, was uh, was added to your Social Security benefit. Um, so the, the, we do get some actual assistance there uh, as the federal government will adjust up based on what's going on in the, in, in, in the world. Bottom line, Social Security will meet only a portion, though, of your retirement uh, income needs, right? And one thing I'll also touch on here is obviously the importance of having uh, those other savings vehicles out there. Um, but a lot of people, I, I, when I'm sitting down with them, they'll say, hey, Eric, you know, I, I, I'm hearing that Social Security won't be there, right? Do not be concerned about that at all. Uh, they have done a means test. Even in 2034, when Social Security is supposedly uh, going to go uh, belly up, right, bankrupt, uh, you still would receive 80% of your benefit. So don't, if you hear any of this out there, don't believe it. Um, you will get 80% of your benefit if they if they don't fix it, which they fixed it in the past. Hopefully, they'll fix it in the future here. Uh, but you still will receive 80% of that benefit. So, employer pension basics, right? This is uh, understanding your options of a single life. That's just based on you. Um, you're going to get more money, obviously, with that type of benefit than you would for a QJSA, which is a qualified joint and survivor annuity. Right. And that's where uh, it will cover both you and your spouses. And you can set that percentage up for how much your spouse would receive if you pre predeceased your spouse. It can be anywhere from 50 percent to 100 uh, percent. Other options are lump sum. Some people, you know, maybe retire late in life, have health issues, don't uh, aren't married sit, and want to be able to control that asset, have the ability to take a lump sum. So then they can move that on to a beneficiary. Inflation adjustments, does it adjust or not? Um, a lot do, a lot don't. It just all depends on, uh, you know, the plan documents uh, of your employer. And that's why we always say, hey, read these explanation of benefits thoroughly. You get one shot. This is going to be very similar to 
Social Security or Medicare, you get one shot to not screw it up, right? When you when you apply for benefits. So identifying the gap. So if you compare that annual income that you're going to need in retirement to the income that you can count on from Social Security income and employer benefits, you're likely going to find a gap. Um, obviously, that's unless you're lucky enough to have a very generous uh, employer benefit or employer pension, um, which again is becoming a thing of the past. Uh, you're going to have to, you're, you know, you're going to have unmet retirement needs that will have to be funded with that third leg, right? That that third leg of personal savings and investments. So considerations here on those uh, is investment asset allocation strategy, how much into various types of investments. Again, this is going to be based on your risk profile, which you can handle, which you can't handle. Um, specific investment and product advice based, again, on that situation of risk and um, you know what you want to do in your retirement. We all hear about this withdrawal rate. 4% is the, the rule. It's been the steadfast rule for quite some time, but it's getting it and coming under a lot of pressure of late because bond rates are not what they used to be, right? We've had a 35-year bull market in bonds. Um, and quite honestly, you know, the capital assumptions and the market assumptions for bonds aren't what they were 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. Um, so that could bring that withdrawal rate down to maybe three, three and a half. We've heard as low as two and a half percent withdrawal rate to keep uh, and be able to handle any type of volatility in the market. Order of withdrawals, right? You want to keep your taxable income as low as possible. Um, you know, what's important to you uh, in terms of how to take that money out? Is it for now or is it for legacy? So do I touch my Roth IRA first or do I touch my, my uh, traditional IRA? All is going to depend on those unique situations uh, based on how your assets are allocated, what you want to do, um, and if there's any type of major uh, gains within these assets. And then, of course, we have required minimum distributions with the SECURE Act of 2020. We now do not have to start touching those till age 72, up from age 70 and a half. So asset allocation, right? We're, once we get into retirement, we're going to have this big transition from those accumulation years uh, and employer matches to this point of distribution. So now we have to look at, hey, is this going to be able to hold up against future shocks, right, in the market? So a more moderate stance or conservative, again, depending on you, from that growth uh, accumulation, um, still able to commit money to it while the market's down that you had um, prior to this distribution phase, right? We need more consistency. We're going to need more uh, reliability, less volatility, things of that nature. Um, immediate income versus longer term return, having that balance. Um, you know, basically, if you look at an effective plan, you're going to provide ongoing income to meet those basic living expenses, minimize volatility, again, having the right plan uh, allocated correctly, have that reliability, um, put your head on the pillow at night, even through tough times, knowing that, hey, I've got a plan in place that this is the, you know, I'm playing the long game here, and this works over time. Maximizes likelihood that savings will last as long as you need, and of course, maintaining those purchasing power of your dollars, which is, you know, keeping pace with inflation. So here's some considerations of, you know, investment vehicles, very simple bonds, you know, bond funds. Um, you're going to have uh, dividend paying stocks. Mutual funds aren't on here, but all these things, you know, treasury inflation protected securities, you know, bonds that do well in, in times of inflation, um, distribution funds. Um, there's also another option, which we'll talk, talk on the next slide for income. It's called annuities. And this is very simple, um, contract between you and the insurance company, right? Where you pay premiums, the insurer, the insurer promises to make, go on to the next slide. The, uh, issuer promises to make payments for fixed time or life, right? So you have that guaranteed income stream for life. It's that certainty that bridges that gap. No matter what the market does, it's going to give you that fixed number uh, as long as you're alive. Fixed income, though, means less flexibility, but annuities have become more 
accessible uh, over the last 15 years. Um, a relative return on investment, it's more going to be, you know, on the higher end of fixed income type returns um, for an income type of annuity. Uh, but bottom line can be a full or partial solution, um, but they're not right for everyone, right? If you have a pension, two Social Security benefits and no debt, why do I need to pay for a lifetime benefit? You don't. You would just put it into a, a, a lower cost option for you. But they are, again, going to be um, based on each individual situation um, and their ability to, you know, handle handle risk within the marketplace. So here's that withdrawal rate, personal savings, right? Those current versus the future income needs, that sustainable withdrawal rate, right? That maximal, the max amount that you can take out without depleting your assets. Um, calculation methods are based on your age, um, your your risk tolerance, but that four to five percent typical withdrawal rate is coming down rapidly. Again, uh, that's something that we are really um, concerned about, right, with, with where interest rates are and having that fixed income, that safe portion of our portfolio, um, just has a little bit more, um, you know, risk towards it to, to inflation. Um, having this withdrawal rate, though, is import, particularly important in the early years of retirement, significant impact on how long your savings will last. So not draining more than that comfortable withdrawal rate, when we run these plans, we run uh, a Monte Carlo analysis, and not to get too deep, just a lot of um, what ifs and performance uh, outcomes. Uh, we want to make sure that you know you're going to be able to get through those tough times and not taking out more during those early years when a market might have had a correction. Again, that sequence of returns. So having that plan in place to make sure that uh, we can stomach those uh, those downturns and weather those storms. Order of withdrawals, it's all going to be based on individual circumstances, right? Tax deferred accounts, uh, such as traditional, Roth, and taxable accounts, income concerns versus state planning concerns. So, a lot of people might have highly appreciated stock, um, let's just say Procter and Gamble, to use a local name, and maybe their cost basis is $20, but you know, the, the stock's trading at, well, without me looking, let's just say $140. Um, do I want to? Do I want to take money from that, even though it's uh, in a taxable account, right? A lot of the order of that you hear is taxable first, then deferred, then tax-free. Well, maybe not. Maybe I have got plenty of money, and I want to move this on to my net next generation, where a they can step up the basis of my Procter and Gamble stock to that 140 on my day to debt. So that might become, like I said, a, a strategy for you that is not going to be the typical order of tax taxable tax deferred, tax free. So again, it's going to be all based and governed on your personal um, circumstances. Next slide, we're going to have some other potential sources of income. These are going to be last ditch efforts, I call this page, right? This is where you hear about the reverse mortgages, proceed with caution. Um, you know, this is these are your last options to explore. Uh, and then we have value, cash value of life insurance which can certainly lessen debt benefits uh, and reduce that for your next generation planning. So recap, when do you plan to retire? How long do you plan? Uh, how long a period should you plan for? What's that income? Is there a gap? What will I need? How much income can you expect from Social Security and an employer pension? And then how am I going to meet these, you know, with personal savings and my, my withdrawal rates, my order of withdrawals, uh, and other potential income sources such as annuities or uh, investments? or interest income. Um, and with that, we will go on to what I use for our members to, to give to a lot of these answers, right? And so Money Guy Pro, which you see up here on your screen, as I mentioned earlier, it's one of the offerings that we are really excited about here at, uh, at the Credit Union. Um, it's an advisor-based planning software that we use with our members, and it helps them plan for retirement, right? What it does is it provides a clear roadmap for you to follow in retirement to ensure, hey, my plan is on track. And this is specifically and especially important with retirements, as I mentioned, lasting longer, volatility being very real. Uh, and what it does is we look at all your assets, your, your investment assets, your retirement savings. We look at those income sources that I mentioned, such as Social Security, pensions, 
And then we discuss, hey, what are your goals? You know, breaking those down into further into needs, wants, and wishes, prioritizing those goals. And finally, what we do is we stress test all these inputs over 1,000 different market scenarios. This is that Monte Carlo analysis I was talking about, as if you were to live your life a thousand different times with a thousand different return possibilities. And what we like to see is typically a success rate uh, in that green area or blue area, which is roughly above 75 to 80 percent over those 1,000 tests. And what it does is it's a great tool for you to follow through retirement. Again, a map, as it is very comprehensive dive. It's a you know deep dive into your particular situation. One thing I'll mention, this is a free member service. A lot of these plans cost four, five, six hundred dollars to develop. We uh, and you guys as members of the credit union uh, have complete access to this as a free member service. And one of the things we also like, you know, this is just a one pager of, of, of the software, but we have a more detailed video on our investment services website. And I encourage you to jump on there after the webinar. And it's about a two, three minute video. And it really kind of explains a little bit more in depth, but, uh, uh, certainly something that uh, has changed my business as an advisor. Um, you know, it becomes, um, like I said, it just becomes a lifeline for you and really gives you that, uh, you know, peace of mind, knowing that I'm allocated, I can do what I want to do. Uh, and if, it, and it, you know, say we are in the purple in some of these meters here, well, it, it's going to give us suggestions, whether that is, you know, take, take more risk, save more. Maybe, unfortunately, it might be work another year or two. Um, but we'll get to an answer to try to get you into that green zone where we feel confident that, hey, we can meet all this stuff through that, uh, you know, 25 or excuse me, 30, 35 year uh, retirement that you're planning for. So with that, I will pass it back to Kelly. All right. Thank you, Eric. So we'll go ahead and get into the Q&A portion of today's webinar. So if you do have a question, please submit that using the question feature. In your attendee panel, if you have a question that you want to save for after today's webinar, Eric's information is up on the screen and welcomes any calls um, to get that conversation started. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and start with the first question. We have a few in the chat. Um, the first one being, do you use the rule of 100, 100 minus age for exposure to the market? I think it's a little antiquated. That's the old Warren Buffett rule. Um, you know, typically, I use 100 minus your age plus 10 to 15, typically. typically. I think that's more of a realistic, unless you're completely risk averse. You know, um, that's, again, everybody's different. And uh, But I think that if you're, hey, if you're able to handle, you know, moderate levels of risk and based on age, I think a more realistic number is 100 minus age plus 10 to 15. Thank you. The next question is also from the chat. It says, I will retire under the standard Social Security benefit. My wife will receive a small amount of benefit from PERS and will not have any Social Security benefits. When I die, will she still get 50% of my benefits? She'll get that. So depending on what she gets, I don't know if she gets a pension or not, um, but she'll get the full, the higher of the two. Uh, Social Security. Now, again, it it's going to depend on whether she gets a pension if there's, because then you have to look at the, that type of calculation, which I, I can't tell from that question. Um, but if, say there was no pension, uh, you, she would get the higher of the two Social Securities. And then we have a couple of pre-submitted questions as well um, that I want to get into. If anybody on the call has questions, again, please submit that using your question feature so we can get that asked for you live today. The next question we have is, how can I receive help or where can I turn to to identify an exit plan and ensure I feel comfortable in taking the leap to retirement? So yeah, that, just getting to that, that last piece that I was uh, discussing with Money Guide Pro, I think that is the ultimate exit plan for you. You know, I get people that uh, come in here, you know, 12 months out, hey, Eric, let's run through these numbers. Can I walk away? I want to know. And that is a great exit plan. Being able to have a, that plan in place that says, yeah, I can comfortably and confidently uh, walk away. And again, uh, going about that is very easy. It's setting up an appointment with me. It's a member service. There's no cost to you. I send you out an email of things to gather and you start putting this plan in place 
to hopefully be able to walk away on your terms or have that exit plan. The next question is, is there a set retirement age? No, there is not. There's a full retirement age for people, depending on the year you are, you're born, but that is all going to be based on, you know, what makes you tick. Um, there is no, you know, 65, obviously we need to get to for Medicare, as I mentioned earlier. Um, my full retirement age for Social Security is 67. Um, and it's typically going to be between 66 and 67 to get that full uh, retirement benefit, but there is no set age. Then the next question we have is how can I prepare for health care costs, coverage, and options if I retire prior to 65? How can you prepare? Well, hopefully you can talk to your prior employer. A lot of people that get you know early retirement plans or, or walk you know walk away before 65 have access to their employer plan still as a benefit, as a uh, you know an incentive. Um, if not, how do you, you you need to know that you have enough savings in place because again, self-insuring is not a cheap um, endeavor. Uh, but it's all going to be based on hey, do I have savings? Can I do this? Yet? Well, well, let's look at my savings. If I'm not getting my employer's health care plan, do I have enough savings to be able to pay this for three, four, five x whatever that that number of years is before we get to Medicare? Um, because it's, it's going to be substantial. The next question we have also comes from the chat, but this one's asking, are Roth conversions worth it? How long does it typically take to recover the benefit of a Roth conversion? Uh, it, it just depends. It depends on your, a lot of it is all going to depend on your unique situation, your view of where, you know, um, taxes are going to go. Uh, it depends on age, you know, typically, am I living off this money now? Um, again, if, if this person wants to just email me separately, I would suggest to kind of give them, uh, give me their full story and I could answer it better, but it's all, uh, it's all going to depend on a lot of these factors. Um, you know, people that convert, but then are spending this down relatively quick because they need it, right? To, to, to fill that gap, that might not be the right play. Um, is, is legacy important, right? So I want to leave a tax-free benefit to my to my you know children is that where i'm going what do i believe in where taxes are going to be uh again just a lot of variables for there's just no set answer on that or stock answer i should say perfect so um the person who asked that question eric's information is up on the screen like you said if you want to shoot him an email or give him a call um he can get further in depth on that for you the next question is what happens if what happens to my savings if myself or my wife have to go into a nursing home? Okay, so if you don't have insurance, right, if we don't have uh, long-term care insurance, uh, one of the things I mentioned was a Medicaid spend down, and that all depends on, uh, you know, what's, what the situation is. If you're both in there or if one of you is in there, uh, what is the community spouse able to have? Well, there's you know, there's all kinds of rules, such as an automobile, obviously the home, um, and roughly, let's just say, $130,000 in, in in assets. Everything else would be spent down to that point before Medicaid would then kick in. Um, one of the uh, partners we do have is uh, Jennifer Anistet. Uh She's our Medicaid attorney. Uh, she can go a little bit more in depth on that, but uh, that's the typical basic equation for you. Thank you. So we have a couple more questions. Again, if anybody on the call has a question they want to get asked, please do that now. Otherwise, we will end on these next couple of questions. Um, the next one being, let's see here, what should I plan to have paid off prior to retirement? As much as you can, right? This is what I say, debt free is risk free in retirement. It's I smile ear to ear every time I sit down with our members if, you know, just to get as much of that debt off your plate as possible. Um, you know, having no home payment, no car payment. Now, granted, you're going to have to get a new car throughout retirement. You're going to, whether you buy that with cash or you're going to, you know, get a note on that. That's not a major one. But, you know, obviously, 
having that home paid off is a big thing or and having no credit card debt, right? Obviously credit card debt, with credit card debt comes a lot of higher interest uh, or a higher rate, right? Than what we see on our homes or, or other loans such as student loans, things like that. Um, but yeah, as much as you possibly can. If you have the savings, you know, throw it at it. Um, add to your, you know, whether it's, you know, an extra mortgage payment a, a year if you can, you know, that significantly can reduce a 30 year mortgage. Any of these things, because once you get into that, you're not earning as much, you're relying on Social Security, debt free is risk free. That's what I like to say. And then we'll go ahead and end on this last question. Um, it's asking, is there a set total I need to have before retiring? No, there's not. It's going to be based on, you know, this, you or the person who asked the question might be very, you know, very conservative, right, in terms of their spending. And uh, they might only spend, you know, $3,000 a month. And might when they travel, they might spend a thousand or two thousand dollars on travel, whereas somebody else is, you know, seven or eight grand a month. They travel twenty grand a year. Um, everybody's going to be different, and that's why having that that Money Guy Pro plan in place is is going to be able to look at your specific situation. There is no specific amount, but it will look at the amount you have compared to what you want to do, and say, hey, yes, we can do this. Um, but there is no set dollar amount. Everybody, you know, says, Eric, I hear it's a million dollars. Well, it might be, but it, it might be more. If, you know, I have, <laughs> I can't tell you, I've had some of those tough conversations along the planning process as well, where, yeah, the guy's got 1.5 million, but unfortunately he spends 12 grand a month. Well, you know, and he doesn't get a pension. He just gets Social Security. You know, that doesn't hold up well against future shocks while you're drawing money down uh, and you have a 2008 come along, right? So, um again that there is no set number it's going to be based on you individually all right thank you so much eric for taking us through today's presentation and taking the time to answer questions that is going to conclude our q a session so thank you all so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day